Good morning. Happy Valentine's Week to you all. I have a little poem I'd like to read to you. Roses are not always red. Violets can be white or blue. But what never changes, Lord, is the love coming from you. I know I'm not perfect, but you love me anyway. Your love is like the sunshine that brightens up my day. You love me like no other. What more could I need? For your love comes with a satisfaction guarantee. Your love is in my heart. I can feel it with each beat. I can't think of anything so fragrant and so sweet. Roses sometimes are red. Violets may come blue. But your love for me, Lord, is constant and true. That is by Deborah Ann Belka. Almost Valentine's Day and Happy Super Bowl Sunday. We're very glad that you joined us this morning for worship at Sharp Memorial, really on the campus of Young Harris College. Do we have anyone worshiping with us for the very first time today? If you're here for the first time, raise your hand proudly, wave at me. Nope. Welcome back, everybody. We're glad you're here. And if you haven't already, please be sure to sign the red attendance pad. And I was going to say pass it down the pew, but just pass it around the table. We do have a number of announcements. The first one I'd like to uh, call your attention to is that we have a table outside Super Hall here that has lots of information on it. Uh, also, chances for you to sign up to volunteer and uh, sign up for things that you might be interested in. For example, there is a sign-up sheet out there. If you're interested in taking the Lenten Bible study that Stephen will be conducting, called A Disciple's Path, please sign up out there. Um, if you can volunteer for the second Saturday of service, or not second Saturday, just Saturday of service. It is this one. It's this coming Saturday. And there's a sign-up sheet out there for that. Um, if you are interested in attending the update on the United Methodist Church next Sunday at 1 o'clock, please let me know or let Jackie know so that we have an idea of where we might need to reserve a room. If any of you brought wedding pictures or wedding albums, and please look over here to the side if you have not had a chance to see what some of us look like in our younger years. I invite you to take a look at that, see if you can identify who's in those pictures. It's, it's, quite, a, it's quite interesting to see how we have progressed over the years. Um, but be sure to take those with you when you leave today if you brought one. Anything else I've forgotten, Stephen? Okay. All right. Now, as we prepare our hearts for worship, let us pray. God of love, plant us in the soil of your grace and nurture us with the strength of Christ, the vine of everlasting life. Enlighten us 
with the wisdom of your spirit, which flows through us today and all days. Abide in us, that we may abide in you and live in your love. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Our hymn of praise this morning is Blessed Assurance. It's uh, number 369, if uh, you're looking in your bulletin for the insert. Verses 1 and 2 we're going to sing today. Let's stand and sing. <laughs>
Um, today we have as our ministry moment uh, Sally Barker, who is our chair of our Stewardship Finance Committee, and she has a word for us today. I have to start by saying this is a brand new hat for me to be wearing in this church. I've worn several, but this is a new one, and um, I promise this to be very interesting. <laughs> As chair of the Stewardship Finance Committee, I debated about how to begin this message, but I decided to do it with some what might be surprising news. First, let me ask you, how many of you have read the newsletter? Okay, then maybe it won't be very surprising to you. <laughs> For the fiscal year 2022, Sharp Memorial fell short of meeting its budget by nearly $21,000. Now that I have your attention, <laughs> let me reassure you that we're still sound financially. We have money in prior year surpluses and other monies that are available. Is this the first time this has happened? No. In the last 10 years, it's happened twice before. But this is the largest shortfall we've had. Our giving fell short last year, so we have our work cut out for us in 2023. Much of that work will be led by the Stewardship Finance Committee, working with the administrative board and other committees within the church. What exactly does the Stewardship Finance Committee do? And I've just learned this recently. It develops the budget for the church with input from all of the church committees. It reports to and makes recommendations to the administrative board, which is the decision-making uh, group for the church. It monitors and manages the church finances and budget. It communicates with the congregation and the committees of the church, and it supports the ministries of the church. At the heart of the work of the Stewardship Finance Committee is stewardship. Biblically, a steward is someone who has been entrusted with the property of the owner and is expected to manage it wisely as the owner himself would. We are all stewards of the gifts that God has given us. And we should all work to honor God's faith in us. Who serves on this committee? When I call your name, would you please stand? Jamie Bruton, who's the chair of the administrative board. Ted Bruton, who is a member at large. Tina Eddy Ferguson, the chair of the Council on Ministries. Ben Lilly, member at large. Frank Morgan, the Chair of Trustees. Bill O'Hara, a member of the Endowment Subcommittee. Frank Riley, Chair of Staff Parish Relations Committee. Liz Ruff, member at large. Stephen Solon, Pastor and Ex Officio member. Dan Thomas, Lay Leader. Kim Tiger, Church Treasurer. And Kirk Vardaman, member at large. Those of you who have been at Sharp for a while know that we have a history of being a generous church. We give generously to the operation of the church and to its missions. We also give generously to local, national, and international missions. That generosity has been enabled by the consistent giving of our members and by substantial gifts from some of our members. We have been blessed, and we will continue to be. But it's our role as the stewards of Sharp Memorial to work to grow and wisely manage the gifts of this church in the days ahead. So what plans do we have for, two, for 2023 so that we can meet our budget? First of all, in, additional, in addition to the regular activities of the committee, we plan to communicate more frequently and in different ways with all of you, our congregation. We plan to report in the weekly bulletin the previous week's giving along with our weekly targeted giving. And if you check the bulletin today, 
you'll see that. That way you all have a sense of how are we doing with, with this work. We will continue to include the monthly financial report in the newsletter, which many of you probably saw. And we will also send out e-sharps because we know that some folks aren't here to pick up a copy of the newsletter or don't read the newsletter online, but we will also be sending emails. And we also plan to present information to you all periodically via ministry moments. If any of you have any questions about church finances, please feel free to contact me or a member of the committee and we will get answers to your questions. Secondly, we will continue to monitor the church's ongoing finances and we'll make recommendations to the administrative board because the budget is a living document. It's not set in stone. It's something that we can change if we need to with the approval and input from folks in the church. As we seek to guide the stewardship of Sharp Memorial's finances, we ask you for your support and for your prayers. Thank you. God's Valentine gift of light to us was not a bunch of flowers. It had not been candy or a book to while away the hours. His gift was to become a man so he could freely give his sacrificed love for us so you and I could live. He gave us sweet salvation and instruction, good and true, to love our friends and enemies and love our Savior too. In order we give our Valentines, let's thank our Lord and King. The reason we have love to give is the fact that he gave everything. My Jesus, I love thee. I know you are mine.
Uh, if you have been uh, married for 50 years plus, would you come forward this time? <laughs> if your name is on that list, would you line up right here in front, preferably with the one that you're still married to? <laughs> You notice this list is pretty long. We got quite a few people that have uh, done uh, 50 years. Have you done 50 years? Wow. That's it. Okay. As you notice, we made a change in the bulletin. It says prayers for the people. One of the things I mentioned to you last week was the fact that. Uh, 40 to 50% of teenagers who are active in their youth groups drop out uh, within a year uh, and walk away from the faith. There is one statistic that changes things dramatically in the passing on of the faith. It is those who are growing up with those who remain married. So the children of long marriages have a much greater chance of staying within the church, statistically, than those that we don't. So the question begs, how much ministry are we doing as a church for marriages? How much are we giving time and energy so that we have long marriages? Now, I, do we ask any of y'all what, uh, what's the secret? <laughs> Ted, what's the secret? Long life. Long life. <laughs> means you've lived a long time. What low expectations. <laughs> Any other great words, Penny? Tell me something good. <laughs> yes, dear. <laughs> Penny, what? Patience. Whatever you say. Whatever you say. <laughs> Being on the road a lot. <laughs> Respect for each other. It doesn't just happen. It doesn't just happen. It is something that we work at. And I think that that's the quality of, that love does. It works. It, it doesn't give up. It endures. And there is something beautiful about long relationships. There is something about that which is lived together for a long time. I want to thank God for each and every one of you. And uh, I want to thank God for the uh, fellowship committee that put together these gifts for you. Yes. Alabama. And as we, uh, as a congregation, have a, uh, a prayer of dedication for these, a celebration of these, uh, let us also just pray for marriages as a whole. Because there are those who are thinking about marriage. There are those who are thinking about ending marriage. There are those that are thinking about how long can we do this? <laughs> Let us pray for love. Let us pray. God, it is, it is you that we have found love. It is because of you that we have learned about love. It is you that has guided love in our hearts and in our lives. And so where we find love, we find you, O oh God. And may we continue to lift up your presence in our life as we seek to be a people of love, as we seek to be a people of long relationships, as we seek to love not just when it's easy, but when it's hard. And to love when it's needs for depth and not just the shallows. Lord, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health. May we learn to love, O oh God, all our days. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Thank you all. Let's give them a hand.
have those prayers for the people that are listed in our bulletin. Mary, Marcia, Alan, Eva, Carol, Gertrude. We also want to remember in prayer the huge devastation that continues to grow in the aftermath of the earthquake in Turkey and Syria. It's devastating. There's a part of me that's uh, that is angry. The anger is the fact that somebody got wealthy. Somebody made an extra buck on buildings that weren't built properly. I know a little bit about that because I've made trips to El Salvador. And I know that whenever we were asked to build a structure, Knowing that there are earthquakes regularly, we use lots of rebar in anticipation of what might happen during an earthquake. I also hope that our hearts are filled with the love and a compassion that reaches out even in spite of the injustices that are evident. But that we have people that give generously to Uncor. For the United Methodist Church is one of those great institutions that collectively give hundreds of millions of dollars every year to disasters just like that. We consistently are the first ones to arrive and the last to leave. Because we know that it's not just a photo op. We know that it's not just a time to do some immediate things, but it's to be a long-term process. May we pray for these people. May we pray not only for the people, but let us be in prayer for the mission of the church. So when you look at the calendar, I hope that you'll pray for those things that are listed, that God's Spirit will be moving within those gatherings, those events, those times that we seek to be the church in the community. And may God open doors for us that we might show God's love in the midst of uh, any one of those encounters, whether it's here on campus or whether it's in the community at a civic meeting, whether it's just walking through the neighborhood or walking through the local parks. May God open doors that we might be the church wherever we are. So let's pray for the people, and let's pray for the mission of the church. Let us pray. When we think about you, O oh Lord, we very early and quickly think that you are the God of love. And in that love, we feel that individually, but we also recognize that you so loved the world that you sent Jesus so that we could see love in action, so that we could see the, the meaning and the purpose and the mission of love in our life as we seek to follow Jesus. Oh God, enlarge our hearts that we might receive your love. Open our eyes, O oh God, that we might see the need where your love is needed. Quicken our hands to be ready to serve. That where there is service and love, there is transformation and there is new life. Let your love abound in all of us who seek to be the church today and tomorrow. For the reason that we are here is for those who have loved us in yesterdays and encouraged us to be loving, faithful, trusting in you.
Touch our hearts this day, O oh God, with the, with the power of your love. That we might love through the years. That we might serve gladly. And that, Lord, what you have given us to be the stewards, stewards of, that we might give generously. And knowing that it is your church with the specific mission and purpose the transformation of lives and the transformation of your world let the power of your love by your spirit reign upon us this day and may we be filled and so moved by that love that we can't help but to share it we can't help but to show it we can't help but to give it away So we pray, as Jesus taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Would our ushers come forward at this time that we might continue in the act of worship as we seek to give to be faithful. Be patient. Our ushers probably have no clue how they're going to do the offering plays today. <laughs> But I know you who brought coffee in here are liking the tables. I understand. Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you that we have gathered as your church. And we seek to love you and one another by this act of our giving. May it honor you. May it spread across the land. A love that cannot be hid. But a love that comes from you to reach your people. The people in need. In Christ we pray. Amen.
glad y'all are here. What would I do if y'all weren't here? I wouldn't have children's time, would I? I'd have to speak to small children or something. Yeah, oh, you had your colors on today. Oh, my goodness. I guess that's who you're rooting for, huh? Yeah, all right. Did you find the other person here that's got those other colors on? <laughs> Lots of reds, but I don't think they're all rooting for Kansas City Chiefs. Though. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, mainly because of uh, Valentine's. But, uh, so that's great. I, so um, I want I want to ask y'all something. So you've heard the you've heard about the word love before, right? You love, you love, and you know. You, uh, but I want to ask, how would you define the word? What does love mean? love is being very present with somebody. I'm with you. I'm with you, right? Love is um, I care for you and what your needs might be. Jesus went up to people and he cared for them, right? What their needs, whatever they were, whatever they were going through at the time. Love is something that I think that when you do that, then you get a smile back, don't you? You do, don't you? That's what love does. Love changes the other person. And so the better that you and I can love, the better that it changes us and others. And I think that's what God wants. That, that, that kind of love lives with us and changes us and helps us change others. Let's pray. God, I thank you for a love that you have given love that changes our life in hopes that when we give it away, that love will change others. Bless these children, oh God, and may they experience and be surrounded with your love every day of their life, that they may grow in your love. When love is found, is found in your bulletins. We'll sing verses one and five. Let's stand and sing together.
there are some times when um, I think I have been so clever and immediately regret my cleverness. I thought that it would be really neat to have a sermon series on love, and it came to me that I'm going to talk about love through fears, love through the years, and love through the tears. And I thought, I am so clever. <laughs> and then to be able to come up with material, to come up with what in the world I'm going to say, I have to admit, love just is something that's profoundly more, it's easy to talk about, it's another thing to actually do and preach about. Because I really do want my words to inspire action. I really do want my sermons to mean something beyond just this moment that we've gathered together. I want the inspiration of God's Spirit to so move us that it changes us. To be the church not only wherever we're gathered, but wherever we're scattered to. So, in no particular order, I have developed this series to talk first about love through the fears. Because I think that that's where it begins, right? It begins with God. And that perfect love casts out all fear. Since this was the Valentine's weekend, uh, love through the years made sense. At the time. And then we're going to end with love through the tears. Which to me, as I was thinking about this week, what a sorry way to end talking about love, Stephen. <laughs> but I'll tell you this. Before I got married, I didn't cry very much. Before I had children, I didn't cry. But all of a sudden... As I move through these years, I can watch a Hallmark and cry. <laughs> I sometimes can even watch a Marvel movie. And in the sense of some miraculous event, tears come. I don't think it's because I'm silly. I think it's because God just hasn't given up on working in my heart. To open up, make it just a little bit bigger than it is. And so every time I read the scriptures, every time I think about who God wants me to be in the life of Jesus Christ, I'm challenged um, to love more deeply, to love more like Jesus, and to love not only when it's easy, but to love when it's hard. From the Psalm, the 36th Psalm, I begin with verse 5. Your steadfast love, O Lord, extends to the heavens, your faithfulness to the clouds. Your righteousness is like the mighty mountains, your judgments are like the great deep. You save humans and animals alike, O Lord. How precious is your steadfast love, O oh God. All people may take refuge in the shadow of your wings. They feast on the abundance of your house, and you give them drink from the river of your delights. For with you is the fountain of life. In your light we see light. O oh, continue your steadfast love to those who know you and your salvation to the upright of heart. Do not let the foot of the arrogant tread on me, or, hand, or the hand of the wicked drive me away. From John chapter 15, where he begins to talk about us being connected with God with, in, in the way that vine and branches are connected. He says this, As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. I have said these things to you 
so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I do not call you servants any longer because the servant does not know what the master is doing. But I have called you friends because I have made known to you everything that I have heard from my father. You did not choose me, but I chose you. And I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, so that the father will give you whatever you ask in my name. I am giving you these commands so that you may love one another. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Love begins with God. We love because God first loved us. God is of love. Where there is love, God is present. Love with God is forever. The psalmist said, your steadfast love, O Lord, extends to the heavens, your faithfulness to the clouds. God has been talked about being a God of love for a long time. A steadfast love, a faithfulness that reaches the clouds. That what is what love is. So for a very long time, our understanding of God, first and foremost, is a God of love. And those who follow this God are to be, first and foremost, a people of love. To understand Christianity is to see how the love of God is lived out in Jesus. Jesus is love in action. In Jesus, the fullness of God was pleased to dwell so we understand that what our faith is foremost about is one of love. In the early days of Methodism, John Wesley encouraged Christians to follow some general rules for living. It's just a good thing to have a few rules. Wesley wrote, wrote a few of them. He called them the general rules. And these rules were written about later on uh, by a book by the uh, bishop named Reuben Job and called these three simple rules. Some of y'all may have studied that and remembered that. Those simple rules are that come from the general rules that Wesley wrote years and years ago. First, do no harm. Second, do good. And the third one, stay in love with God. These rules for me are just a way to help us understand how love acts in the church and in the community. When you think about new life, what comes to mind? New life. When you think about reconciliation, what comes to mind? When you hear that there's reconciling going on. When you hear about forgiveness, what do you think about? Are not these the acts of the power of love working in and through us? When you and I seek to live in love, it is said, Reuben Job said, it's a way of holy living that is constantly reforming and renewing the individual and the community. Loving God results in loving the world. Loving God brings forth that new life through reconciliation and forgiveness in works for justice and healing the brokenhearted. In his book, he says, it's impossible to stay in love with God and not desire to see God's goodness and grace shared with the entire world. I find it very interesting, though, that John Wesley began his general rules for Christian living beginning with the rule, do no harm. Is it because that one's easier than the others? Is it because that is maybe the first step? I really don't have a good answer for you today. But maybe it's to get us off on the right foot. 
When we look at this rule to do no harm, we may ask, what harm am I doing? Yes, we ought to think more deeply about how love should be in our life when we consider if we are harming somebody by gossiping, by undercutting a co-worker's efforts, by starting rumors or even continuing rumors of other people <laughs> that we don't like. We ought to think more about how that we might do harm by speaking down about others we don't even know. But maybe, instead of asking the question, what harm am I doing, we might consider the deeper questions where love grows. Who or what is being harmed? What harm is being done to them? The deeper question of love in do no harm is, do I even see the harm being done? In this day, the answer is simply overwhelming. Every day, you and I see victims of war, victims of poverty. We see the sick and injured on TV, or we can Google it. That's for the younger crowd, you know. But do we see the harm up close and personal? To get to the second rule of love requires us not only to see the need, but also to take action. To do good, as the second general rule is, is a proactive way of loving. It is not necessary for us to wait to be asked to help. Lord, open our eyes to see the needs of others. Lord, open our hearts to respond in love. Lord, lead me to the places that need healing to the people who are hungry and thirsty, abused, neglected, and forgotten. One day, Jesus read from the scriptures some verses that describe his ministry. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. Does our love as a church bring good news to the poor? John Wesley wrote, One great reason why the rich in general have so little sympathy for the poor is because they so seldom visit them. Wesley encouraged a church to spread the good news of God's love by consistently visiting the poor. More than charity, more than handouts, to be present with love. A love that brings new life. A love that forgives and transforms. Hear this verse out of 1 John chapter 3. How does God's love abide in anyone who has the world's goods and sees a brother and sister in need and yet refuses help? Little children, let love not let love not in word or speech, but in truth or action. Do no harm and do good will be impossible to sustain if the third rule is not evident in our lives, and that is to stay in love with God. Love is found with God. And to stay in love with God only increases our love. Perfect love casts out fear, the Bible says. So fear is the great enemy of love. I know because I've been married for 39 years. Okay, a little more laughter than that. <laughs> fear makes us run away from each other. But fear can never create love. When we fear, we seek what seems to be safe places that distances us from one another. When we move away to avoid relationships, we move away from the love that can heal us. Jesus told stories of reconciling and forgiving love that renewed lives and restored relationships. As a church, we should have those same kind of stories as well. 
And the first one that I remember, Melanie was letting me know how she felt. It was a little more than I was anticipating. In fact, it was a lot more than I was anticipating. I didn't want to say anything stupid, so I remained silent. And in the silence, God spoke to me and said, Stephen, she's not against you. She's for you. It was a word I needed to hear because what it seemed like was she was against me. <laughs> in another one, at another time, in a very different place, I began to wonder what it was like to have just one foot in and maybe one foot out. And I began to recognize that marriage only lasts when both feet are in by both people. And I recognized that Melanie and I needed to work at that. That love was really building a trust that both feet are in. And then, in another place, when we recognized more fully that both feet were in, we could share the pain that was really going on in each other's lives. And in the sharing of the pain, we found healing. For to me, that's what love really does. This world can beat any of us up. This world can be hard. But I'm convinced that God's love comes to heal. And God's love comes to mend. God's love comes to make us whole. And God's love is that which renews our life. And so when love has endured the valleys, and when love has endured the sorrows, one can celebrate the mountaintop view of a love that's overcome. That's the challenge of all of our times of loving one another. Whenever we're Whenever we have those times when we might fear, will our love make a difference? I know that it does, and I know that it will. And so I pray that God gives us a love like his. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Would you turn to your bulletin? And you might as well stand, because we're going to stand for our final hymn. But I'd like for us to turn to the front of our bulletin, a candle of love, and let's respond. You respond in the dark, friend. Let love be genuine. Live in harmony. Hate what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Outdo one another in showing honor. Be humble and never conceited. Love is stronger than death, and jealousy is cruel as the grave. Bloods cannot drown love, and wealth cannot buy it. Put love above all else. Let Christ's peace rule in your hearts. Always be forgiving, as Christ has forgiven you. Love is not jealous or boastful, arrogant, rude, or stubborn, irritable, resentful, or possessive. Love is patient. Kind. Do not love in word or speech only, love also in deed and truth. Receive each other in sincerity, find mercy and grow old together. Love rejoices in the right, it bears, believes, hopes, and endures all things. For love is faithful and endless. When the Lord builds the house, the labor is never in vain. Happy are those who take refuge in God. Those who serve the Lord are redeemed. If today you want to answer God's call of love and make a profession of faith, I invite you to come forward. If today you want to join the church, knowing that this will be a great family of faith for you 
to grow in love, I invite you to come forward as we sing our final hymn. I love to tell the story. We're going to sing verses 1 and 2. Thanks. 